on improving surgical training, the use of feedback to reduce errors and improve retention during the simulated surgical procedure. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairperson, distinguished faculty, and ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank the Royal Congress for giving me the chance to present this data. I'd also like to thank my co-authors and my mentors. I'd also like to thank Epicon for their support of this project. Virtual reality simulation was first proposed as an important adjunct to surgical training as far back as 1993, even though it had been used in the aviation industry for many years before that. It does present a very attractive solution to many of the problems facing surgical training today, as we heard this morning in the Gerald Marks lecture. It allows trainees to practice their skills in a safe environment without exposing the patient to any intraoperative errors or complications. It allows us to standardise training across different regions and different programmes. It also allows us to save valuable operating room time by bringing pre-trained trainees to the operating room. And it also makes training more efficient as it can be designed around the individual needs of trainees. With the increases in technological, te technology in the last few years, we've also seen big developments in the kind of simulation available. From initial simulators which trained more basic abstract tasks to more advanced simulators, which now allow us to practice complete procedures in a very high fidelity environment. However, despite these attractions, there was initially quite healthy scepticism about the value of simulator training and doubt as to whether skills gained in the simulation lab were transferred to the real environment of the operating room. However, these, doubt, these doubts have been allayed in recent years with the publication of a large amount of research which does in fact support the use of simulation and shows that skills gained in the lab do in fact transfer to the operating room. This slide shows results from one of the first such trials which was published. This looked at a group of residents from Yale and looked at, looked at a group who were trained to proficiency on a simulator and saw that when they performed part of a lap coli in the real operating room, they made six times fewer errors than their control trained counterparts. So really there's no doubt that simulation is a very important part of training. The question now is how can we improve the efficiency of simulator training and make it more valuable? And one of the aspects in the training environment we decided to focus on was the provision of performance feedback. Feedback has consistently been shown to be a very important aspect of the learning environment. And um, this is not just in the surgical training literature, but also in learning psychology. It's been previous stu previously studied with more simple tasks, such as suturing and knot tying. And the aim of this study was to study the effect of feedback on a more complex procedure. So we selected the hand-assisted laparoscopic colectomy. The simulator we used in the study, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a PROMIS hand-assisted laparoscopic colectomy simulator. It consists of a body form and a laptop computer. In order to form a complete procedure, a plastic tray with models of the intra-abdominal organs is inserted into the simulator. The trainee can then insert their instruments through the body form and perform the complete procedure while looking at their performance on the laptop computer, which functions as a laparoscopic monitor. So this is an example of a augmented reality simulator and that it combines virtual graphics with the real organ models. It allows a trainee to use real surgical instruments during the procedure, which increases the reality of the, of the simulation. And because the instruments inside the simulator are tracked, it also allows us to objectively assess performance. So for performance assessment in our study, we took this from two sources. One was the simulator metrics which are generated objectively, and these are instrument path length and instrument smoothness. Time to complete the procedure is also recorded, but we didn't use this in our study. The other way of assessment was the error scores. So each anatomy tray after every procedure was examined for the presence of predefined intraoperative errors. And the assessment was carried out by two blinded evaluators. This is a list of the 14 errors we used. They're all quite tightly defined. And both the, instruments, the instrument movement scores and the errors have previously been shown to be constant valid. So in terms of subjects, we recruited surgical trainees who were between PGY3 and 5. They couldn't previously have performed any hand-assisted procedures or any lap colectomy procedures. They were assigned to one of two groups. Group 1 was the control group and Group 2 was the feedback group. So before beginning their training, all subjects had a standardized teaching session, and this included a demonstration of the simulated procedure, but also, they also had an explanation of all the performance metrics and an explanation of the intraoperative errors. And they also had a demonstration and explanation of the laparoscopic instruments they were going to use, and these were the harmonic scalpel and the linear stapler. 
Following the teaching session, all the trainees had an MCQ to ensure they had understood the material, and they were also allowed to have a brief warm-up task on the simulator. Following the teaching session, all subjects then performed five simulated complete cases. The first three cases were performed in Teach Me mode, in which additional on-screen assistance is given by the simulator, and the second two cases were performed in Test Me mode. In terms of our two groups, group one was the control group, and they had facilitation available for every case, and that they submitted to assist them and handle the instruments and rechange, uh, refill their stapler cartridge. However, the group, the, the, in the subjects in the group two had the same facilitation, but in addition, they were given um, interactive feedback after every case, so they were allowed to look at the simulator tray, had all the errors pointed out and explained. So looking then at the results first of the demographics of the two groups, they were quite similar in ter terms of age and in terms of hand dominance. None of the subjects had previously had any experience on this particular simulator, and none had performed any previous hand assist or hand assist laparotomy procedures. So looking then at our performance results, um, this graph shows the um, results, the average results per group from trial one to trial five. Um, as you can see, there was a very smooth learning curve across the five procedures for all subjects, and this was, this was significant. However, the hypothesis of this research was that the feedback given would improve the performance of the group it was given to. And we found that with regard to PATH then, the opposite was actually the case, and that the subjects in the control group um, performed uh, better in terms of instrument movement. We saw a very similar result with regard to instrument smoothness. Again, there was a very clear learning curve demonstrated across the five trials, but the subjects who received feedback in fact performed slightly worse and that they had less smooth instrument movements. The last um, assessment then was the error assessment, and this showed a very different picture to the previous results. This showed a far superior performance in group two who were given feedback compared to the control group, and this was significant. And as you can see, there's also a smoother learning curve in that the, the, the subjects who were given feedback had plateaued by the fourth trial, and there was no big difference between the fourth and the fifth trial. So this was very different to the previous results. Um, our inter-rater assessment was, inter reliability assessment was very high with regard to the anatomy tray assessments, it was 0.96, and it fell below 0.8 for only three individual trays. Um, the next few slides show some of the errors we encountered during the trial. So the picture on the left shows the IMA and the IMV correctly divided as the subjects were instructed to do. The picture on the right shows um, a staple line applied across the mesentery, which shows that the subject hadn't dissected enough mesentery, which would count as an intraoperative error. And the lower picture shows, um, shows the IMV divided correctly, but unfortunately the subject has divided the ureter alongside that and not divided the IMA, which is at the top of the picture. And these are more areas we encountered. On the left is quite an impressive colon perforation. Um, that's a laceration to the left common iliac. And lower down we see again a laceration to the common iliac and also incorrect division of the IMA and that it was divided too distally. So we also did one small um, sub-study. Um, another thing we wanted to investigate was retention of skills. It's well documented in the surgical training literature that um, masked practice is inferior to, to distributed practice in terms of retention of skills. However, this is very hard to avoid in the context of intensive skills courses such as in this study. Um, however, there are other factors which can increase retention, and one of the factors which has been suggested is again the provision of, of performance feedback. So to investigate this, we took a small subgroup. We retested eight subjects in group two. They all performed uh, two further cases on the simulator at an average of 14 and a half weeks after the initial training session. Their performance was assessed in the same way, and they had done no hand assist procedures or any further simulator procedures in between, in between the two testing sessions. And when we looked at their results, the instrument scores had decreased by 38% and 29% respectively. However, the error scores only decreased by 5%. So in other words, they'd almost complete retention of the error scores, but uh, not as good a performance for the instrument movement scores. And this again is probably due to the feedback they received. So to summarize, we found that an interactive performance feedback after every case improved the error scores of all the subjects. Um, this was a very simple thing to provide. It doesn't require an expert faculty to be present. It's also a very quick and easy thing to do and didn't really add that much extra time onto the training. However, this improvement in error scores occurred at the expense of instrument path length and to a lesser degree instrument smoothness. 
And we also saw that retention also appeared to be better for the error scores compared to the movement scores. And again, this is probably an effect of the feedback that was given. There are some limitations to the study. It wasn't a prospective randomized control trial with a small group of subjects. And we didn't have the chance to compare retention in subjects who had and hadn't been given feedback. So we're not sure if that's the only reason why the retention was better for those scores. However, to discuss the results, um, these data do raise important questions about the value of simulator metrics that we use currently. Um, instrument path length and instrument smoothness are extensively used in the literature, and they have been found to be construct valid and also to show discriminative validity, and not just in general surgical procedures, but also in um, gynecological and arthroscopic simulators. So they are very well established. They've also been shown to correlate with um, the basic skill module, the PEG transfer task, and the FLS program. However, there is some suggestion that they may not be an optimal way to assess performance. And it has been said that possibly they're only used because they can be used and because they're very simple to generate and very simple to study. Um, there's been one study published which showed, this looked at um, more, um, more realistic tasks. And it showed that um, the more clinically relevant outcomes of these tasks, such as an astromotic leak rate or suture slippage, had absolutely no relationship with, with instrument movement scores. So there certainly is a suggestion that these scores may not be a very valid way to assess surgical performance. In this case, we feel that the increased path length and smoothness um, in the feedback group was because they were perform performing a more thorough and more careful dissection, and this necessitated more instrument movement. However, however, we felt this was desirable in order to avoid some of the more serious errors that we saw. So to conclude, performance feedback um, can shorten the learning curve and also increase the amount of um, learning that is done during an intensive skills course. We feel this is relevant for more efficient training as it can reduce the length and time required to train um, students and residents and also reduce the cost of training, which is considerable. This can also be applied with um, good effect in the clinical setting and we feel it would lead to improved patient safety. Thank you.